Um, as Marcy mentioned, my name is Ricky McLean. I am with Woodworks, um, and we're going to be talking through designing shaft walls in wood frame buildings. The majority of the presentation will focus on using wood frame shaft walls within a wood frame building, um, but we'll also cover several other topics and go through some code requirements and some detailing aspects. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, as Marcy mentioned, this course is eligible for continuing education credits. Uh, so this is the standard language, as well as the course description um, that you read through when you signed up for this webinar. I won't read this word for word, but you have it as a reference, as well as the four learning objectives. Uh, so before we dive into the technical aspects of the presentation, we thought we'd do a, a light poll and just get a feel for who's on the webinar today. Absolutely, here we go. This one's easy. 68% are engineers, 20% are code officials, and 7% architect, 3% other, and 2% fire service. No matter, again, your profession, we are delighted that you are here and welcome. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and just as a point of reference, I am a structural engineer, um, so I'm glad to have all of you on this um, webinar. I think There'll be aspects that I think all of you will find of, of pertinence to your projects. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about the fire resistance detailing of shaft enclosure walls, but there's also some direct implications on the engineering aspects. Um, so we'll kind of bounce back and forth between both of those aspects of designing shaft enclosures um, per code compliant um, options and provisions. So with that, I wanted to start out with kind of a baseline understanding when we talk about shaft walls, we talk about shafts and shaft enclosures, really what do we mean? What does the code have to say about this? Well, from mainly what we're gonna be talking about is the shaft walls themselves. Of course, those shaft walls are forming what the code calls a shaft enclosure. And really the main purpose of a shaft enclosure is to allow um, vertical uh, transfer, you know, whether it's of people, of mechanical services, um, et cetera, in a building. So we're having you know, holes or penetrations in floor ceiling assemblies. Um, so we're, we're connecting those, those holes within floor ceiling assemblies and really making sure that we don't have passage of fire, uh, smoke, hot gases, those types of things from one floor to another. So you know, simplistically, that's, that's what a shaft enclosure is doing. And then again, most of our, our discussion today will be about the shaft walls that form those shaft enclosures. And from a practical perspective, there were really three different types of shaft enclosures that we have in any given building. And of course, there's stair shafts, elevator shafts, and mechanical shafts. Um, pretty much all of the code sections and code provisions we're gonna talk through in this webinar apply the same to all three types of shafts. Um, really, the, the code doesn't make in most cases, a distinction between which type of shaft we're designing. Um, so most of the code sections will apply throughout. There are some nuances, some differences in terms of how we go about designing and specifically detailing um, shaft enclosures and shaft walls, excuse me, for one type versus the other. And that's more a function of what are the, what are the items within the shaft? You know, for example, an elevator versus stair framing. Um, and then also the size of the shaft has a, comes into play in terms of how we detail the assemblies around it. So we're going to come back to that particular subject at the end of the webinar. So this, this is a common type of framing system that, that we see really in a number of different regions throughout the country where you can see this project is, this one happens to be an apartment building. It's you know, multi-stories of wood frame construction where the entire building is framed with wood with the exception, as you see off to the far right, of the shaft enclosure walls. So in this case, they're using uh, masonry to frame shaft enclosure walls. Um, we're gonna talk through real briefly at the beginning here, uh, you know, what would be some of the reasons or benefits of, in this case, uh, switching those shaft enclosure walls to be framed with wood. Um, and then the majority of the presentation will be looking at, does the code actually allow you to do that? When does the code allow you to do that? What are the unique detailing aspects for things like fire and life safety and structural design that you have to consider um, if you are using wood framing to form these shaft walls? Uh, and then again, at the end of the presentation, we'll come back to if 
if you are going down this route of wood frame building with shaft walls of other materials, then at the very end of the presentation, we'll cover off on things like unique considerations, things like you know material compatibility, differential movement, differences in seismic performance. Um, so that'll be at the end of the webinar. So why would you consider doing wood frame shaft walls? And if you're talking about the, the rest of the building being framed with wood, it's probably all of the same reasons, right? It's, it's the material cost. Um, oftentimes you can find material cost efficiencies in framing a building with wood when the code allows it. Um, it's construction schedule. You know, the fact that you're keeping this all to the same framing crew as opposed to bringing in a separate framing crew just to form up the shaft enclosure walls. Um, and then the material compatibility, I just alluded to this, you know, things like differences in material movement, um, lateral force resisting systems and compatibility issues there. And just to show you one example uh, of a project that, that did realize this potential cost savings, this was a multi-story project in Texas um, that, that we at Woodworks helped the design and construction team with a couple of years ago. Um, you can see the specifics on the size of the building, um, five large shafts within this project, so two elevator shafts, three stair shafts. Um, project initially came in over budget, so they were looking at ways that they could potentially save cost. And they identified if they were able to, to switch the shafts from masonry as they were originally designed into wood, um, they thought maybe this is a way of saving some cost. At the time, the design team wasn't fully familiar with the code allowances that would permit them to do this. Um, so we helped them understand this, uh, the code side of things, and they were able to cut about $175,000 off of the construction cost just by switching the shaft wall materials to wood frame. And there were some implications too, positive implications on overall construction schedule by doing so as well. Most of this presentation will be focused on the use of um, what I would call light frame wood shaft walls, so you know, two by studs. Um, there are some projects that are going the route of using mass timber as a shaft wall enclosure material. I'm not gonna spend a bunch of time on what is mass timber and what are the products that could potentially go into a mass timber building. There are a number of resources that, that Woodworks has, that the American Wood Council has on these subjects. Um, but just to point out that these are some examples of projects that have used mass timber as a shaft wall material. Uh, the ones on the left and the right are using a product called cross laminated timber or CLT as a shaft wall material. And then the one in the middle is using um, NLT or nail laminated timber as a shaft enclosure material. <clears throat> and again, the reasons why you might consider this, it's, it's many of the same reasons we mentioned for light frame wood shaft walls, um, it's cost, it's construction schedule. Um, with mass timber, there's also some unique aspects too, where instead of you know, installing these wood stud walls and then covering with them with gypsum, mass timber also has the capability of providing fire resistance ratings inherent in its given thickness. Um, what that means is that you could potentially leave this exposed on the interior of the shaft, um, highlight that as an architectural feature of the building and still, uh, still meet the requirements of the building code for fire resistance ratings. Um, that project that you just saw um, is, is the same as the one you see here. And this is a project that was constructed down in Alabama. It's a four story hotel, um, all framed with cross laminated timber. And they installed the three shafts. I'll go back to this picture here. You can see the three shafts, the far right, the middle, and then the far left. Uh, those are the first three aspects of this project that were erected. And the first shaft that they installed was this, was this one on the far right. And for all four sides, uh, all four stories tall, it took them about 13 hours to erect all of the CLT panels. Um, then they, as they got going on the project, picked up some more efficiencies, understood the system better. Um, and basically by the time they got to the third shaft, they installed all four sides, all four stories tall uh, in about seven hours. So you can really start to see some potential benefits and speed of construction. Say if you compare that to, you know, forming up a four story tall shaft enclosure using you know, other, other materials, you can definitely see some potential cost savings and schedule savings. So just one more example, this is a multifamily project in Massachusetts, um, in this case, three-story tall CLT shaft walls. And these were erected in basically the time it took from the panels to get on site in the morning till lunch. Uh, 
you know, just about three hours, all of the mass timber shaft walls in this particular project were installed. So uh, I think that just highlights the opportunity that there is with, with new products like mass timber on the market to really lend itself to the speed of construction uh, schedule savings. So here's a list of topics we're gonna to go through. Most of these will go pretty quickly. Um, and we're really gonna focus on the, the front end here of what are the code requirements and then towards the latter half, what are the detailing options to help meet those code requirements? So if we turn to chapter seven in the International Building Code, we'll see that there are five defined types of fire resistance rated walls, right? So we have light frame bearing walls, exterior walls, fire walls, fire barriers, and fire partitions. Now you notice none of these are shaft walls or shaft enclosure walls, right? Uh, the reason for that is if we turn to section 713 of the building code, um, we see that shaft walls shall be constructed as fire barriers, as you see down there in section 713.2. To go back to our list of, of five wall types, so now we know that shaft enclosures are fire barriers. Fire barriers are, are one of these defined fire resistance rated wall types. Um, I will also point out here too that it's really important to keep the, the nomenclature straight. Um, I think a lot of the confusion that comes in when we're assisting design teams with shaft wall questions is confusion regarding these terms. Meaning, you know, in some cases, maybe somebody thinks that a shaft wall has to be built as a fire wall. The fire wall has very different requirements from a fire barrier. You know, differences in what materials are allowed, differences in how those shaft walls intersect a floor or roof assembly. Um, so just to point out that it's, it's really important to keep this nomenclature straight as we go throughout this presentation. So again, uh, shaft walls are constructed as fire barriers. Um, so because of that, when we go through these code sections here coming up, we're gonna kind of bounce back and forth between 713, which is just the general shaft enclosure section, and then 707, which is the fire barrier section of the building code. So first thing we wanna do is, is understand, can I frame a shaft wall with wood? Um, and under what circumstances can I do that? So if we turn to 707, again, this is the fire barrier section. This says that shaft, excuse me, fire barriers are framed of ma any materials permitted by the building's type of construction. So if you're familiar with the five different construction types in IBC, one, two, three, four, and five, um, and up through the 2018 version, um, types one, two, three, and five had subcategories A and B. So we have to define what construction type our building is. Now, if you're framing the rest of the building with wood, uh, chances are you're going to be type three, four, or five construction. And on the next slide, I'll, I'll help um, define or illustrate what the differences between those three types are. Um, so if you're really the, the, short, the short answer is if the, if the rest of the building is framed with wood, then the shaft walls can be framed with wood. Um, but let's take a, a little, a little bit of a deeper look at, at what are the differences between these construction types. So again, focusing here just on types three, four, and five. The reason for that is because those are the three types of construction that the building code allows to be framed with wood throughout. Um, so in type three construction, all of the interior elements. So this is basically everything other than exterior walls. So we're talking about interior partitions. Uh, floor ceiling assemblies, roof ceiling assemblies, all of those, uh, the code says, can be framed or formed with any material permitted by code. So this could be you know, standard light frame wood construction, engineered wood products, mass timber, um, as well as you know, steel studs, masonry, concrete, etc. Any material permitted by code allowed for any interior element in a type three building. And then the exterior walls can be fire retardant treated wood or non-combustible materials. Type four construction, uh, the interior elements are a little different here. Now what we're doing is type four is also commonly referred to as heavy timber type of construction. So you're exposing, the code allows you to expose all of, all of the timber elements on the interior of that structure. Um, they don't require you to demonstrate a specific fire resistance rating. However, they do have to meet minimum sizes. Uh, that the building code dictates, and that varies depending on what the element is. So that's for all of the interior elements in type four construction. And then exterior walls, 
somewhat similar to type three, you can do fire retardant treated wood or non-combustible materials, or you also have the added option here of using cross laminated timber as the exterior walls in a type four building. And the type five construction allows all of the elements, both interior elements and exterior walls to be any material permitted by code. So again, that could include any type of wood framing. So to, to summarize that, again, if we're looking at our options specifically for shaft walls, you can kind of see how it's laid out here. Um, but you can see, regardless of if we're type three or four or five, regardless of if our shaft wall is an interior shaft wall or an exterior shaft wall, we can frame the entire building with wood, including the shaft walls themselves. Now, there are a few nuances in the building code when it comes to exterior walls that are also shaft walls. Um, so think your hotel building where your stair towers are at the far ends of the building, where you know you have a, a wall that's not only forming the shaft enclosure, but it's also an exterior wall. Um, the code does have some unique requirements for that condition, not on a material, um, you know, what materials are permitted basis, but it is more on what are the fire resistance ratings required. And we'll come back to that um, in just a little bit in this presentation. So now we know what, what materials shaft walls can be framed with. So the next thing we need to know is what are the fire resistance rating requirements for those shaft walls? And this is simply a function of how many stories that given shaft enclosure is connecting, not a function of what materials we're using to frame the shaft wall. So simplistically, if our shaft enclosure is connecting four or more stories, those shaft walls need to be rated for two hours. If our shaft enclosure is connecting three or fewer stories, that shaft wall, those shaft walls need to be rated for one hour. Um, so that's the, the distinction there. So with that, let's uh, jump into our first poll question on the technical side of things and, and see what folks have to say here. Okay, here we go. IBC requires all shaft walls to be constructed of non-combustible materials regardless of construction type, true or false. And we've got about an 83% to 17% split here. All right, I've got 80% voted, so let's see. Okay, 82% false, 18% true. And the real answer, Ricky? All right, the real answer is false. So again, just reiterating that we can have wood frame shaft walls in types three, four, and five buildings. And that just reiterates that point. Now there is some upcoming code changes to the 2021 version of the building code. Um, and again, everything else throughout this presentation is based on the 2012 through 2018 versions. But I did wanna point out real briefly um, that there are some changes coming to the 2021 version of the building code, and those will allow significantly taller mass timber buildings in particular than we've ever had. And some new construction types, types 4A, 4B, and 4C will be introduced. Um, specifically on the shaft enclosure side of things, um, in those new construction types, we can frame the shaft walls with mass timber for buildings up to 12 stories or 180 feet. For buildings that are taller than that, uh, the shaft enclosure walls do need to be framed with non-combustible materials. Um, for projects that are below that limit, below the 12, at, at or below 12 stories or 180 feet, again, we can frame those shaft walls with mass timber, but those mass timber shaft walls do have to be protected um, on both sides with a non-combustible material. <clears throat> um, and then also, just to point out that the shaft enclosure walls in a tall mass timber building do have to be rated for two hours. That's a function not only of the fact that we're connecting more than four or more stories, but also one other item that I haven't mentioned so far is that the code requires our fire resistance rating of the shaft walls to be not less than the fire resistance rating of the floor assemblies that they're penetrating. Um, and in all three of these new tall mass timber construction types, the floor fire resistance rating is two hours. Therefore, the shaft wall rating can't be less than two hours. <clears throat> 
All right, so let's jump back into uh, chapter seven, section 713 and 707. Uh, again, we talked through what's the fire resistance rating, what materials are permitted. And the next section I wanted to go over was that of continuity. Um, and specifically looking at the definition of to, to what extent does a fire barrier and a shaft wall need to extend? How, how far in a given wall to wall or floor to floor height? So if we look at 707.5 down here, this is a really important distinction or definition. We're saying we're extending these fire barriers from the top of the foundation or floor ceiling below to the underside of the floor or roof sheathing, slab or deck above, um, and securely attached to those. So some images to help illustrate, what does that mean? Excuse me, these are both from the code commentary to section 707.5. Um, and let's focus on the one on the right. This is obviously the wood frame section. So if you remember that definition of fire barrier continuity, you can see we're starting at the top, in this case of the foundation. So let's say this is a slab on grade. We're starting at the top of that and extending to the underside of the floor sheathing above. You can see this does bypass the depth of the floor structure and extends tight to the underside of the floor sheathing. So that by definition is meeting the continuity requirements of a fire barrier. Now you'll notice that the floor sheathing itself is allowed to pass through, right? That floor sheathing isn't obstructing the continuity. We don't have to completely bypass that floor sheathing. Let's say we were gonna do another wall directly on top of this one. It could then start up you know, right on top of that floor sheathing and that would still meet the continuity requirements for fire barriers uh, because by definition, again, they extend to the underside of the floor sheathing. Example of a picture of kind of what that looks like in practice. Um, so this is a photograph kind of taking, looking up at the underside of a floor system with a wall on the left, which is a shaft enclosure wall, and then a wall on the right, which is an exterior wall. So you notice the difference in how far these walls extend. The one on the right, which is the exterior wall, you can see stops uh, at the underside of the truss top cord bearing points. Whereas the wall on the left, you can see is framed all the way up tight to the underside of the floor sheathing. So again, that's the shaft wall, that's meeting those continuity uh, definition requirements of a fire barrier. Um, so based on that, let's have a poll question on continuity of fire barriers. Sure, all right. Fire barriers are required to extend from the top of the foundation or floor below to the dropped ceiling above, the underside of a fire rated floor or ceiling above, the underside of the floor sheathing slab or deck above, 30 inches above roof surface bypassing all intermediate floors. All right, 75% say the underside of the floor sheathing slab or deck above, and 20% say the underside of a fire rated floor or ceiling above. All right, so Ricky, I'm gonna let you talk about which one is right. Okay, great. So it looks like the majority had the correct answer, uh, which was C. So again, we're going from the top of the floor assembly below to the underside of the sheathing slab or deck above. Um, and to, to really point out the fact that that sheathing itself is not obstructing continuity. So you can have multiple stacked fire barriers on top of each other. They can start and stop at the floor sheathing. They don't need to completely bypass the floor sheathing. All right, another requirement in the building code for uh, fire barriers and shaft enclosures deals with supporting construction. Basically, the idea here is that the supporting construction for a fire barrier has to be at least the same fire resistance rating as the fire barrier itself. So that's illustrated in this image you see here. Let's say our upper wall um, is, is also acting as a shaft enclosure wall. Um, and let's say it's rated for two hours, for example. Well, the, the framing that you see in this red box here, let's say that's a beam or a multi-ply joist, um, that would also need to have the same two hour fire resistance rating, right? You don't wanna have those, that beam or those joists fail uh, after an hour, let's say, and therefore the wall above wouldn't be able to continue to carry its two hour fire resistance rating. So that's, that's really what this supporting construction requirement in the building code is meant to address. 
is this possibility of discontinuous shaft walls or walls that don't continue all the way down to uh, the foundation. Now, there are some, some more gray areas that come in when dealing with not necessarily that, but let's say you have a platform framed floor detail where you have a lower wall, a floor that frames directly on top of that, and another wall starting up above. Um, in that case, that re the code really wasn't intending this supporting construction to apply to that. Um, and once we get into the detailing the floor to wall intersections in just a little bit, we'll explain that some more and provide some options of how to meet both the supporting construction requirements as well as the continuity requirements. All right, another topic that comes up when looking at designing and detailing shaft enclosure walls is penetrations. Um, there's, there's some pretty clear language in the building code for things like, you know, let's say you have, you need to extend a sprinkler line into a shaft enclosure wall or into a shaft enclosure through a shaft enclosure wall, you know, and that sprinkler is going to service the shaft itself. Or same thing for duct work, you know, forming, uh, acting as ventilation for the shaft enclosure wall. Those things are all clear, pretty clear in the building code. The one aspect that I think isn't re as referenced as often is dealing with structural penetrations of shaft enclosure walls. So you can see here 713.8, uh, this is specifically saying that structural penetrations of shaft enclosure walls are permitted, um, but when you do have them, you do need to protect them in accordance with section 714. Before we get into what 714 says, just to illustrate, you know, what, what are these types of structural penetrations and shaft walls that we're talking about? Um, this is showing a couple of examples. So the image on the right, you know, you can see you're looking up at the underside of stair framing. So you have your stringers off to the right, some intermediate landing joists off to the left, and you have this landing beam, and that's basically penetrating the shaft wall, which is the far wall that you see here. Obviously the gypsum wall board is not installed on this wall yet, um, but when it is, it will have to be notched around that beam. Therefore, this beam is a penetration of the shaft wall. That's permitted, as we just saw, but we do need to protect that penetration um, per section 714 in the building code. So if we turn to 714, basically it gives us two options for doing this protection uh, of our structural penetration. The first one is citing a fire-tested wall assembly that included that penetrant in the wall test. In other words, let's say somebody were to do an ASTM E119 fire test on a wall assembly, and in that fire test, they included you know, a section of a wood beam sticking into the wall. Not very common, um, so the more common solution is to use the one you see at the bottom of your screen, where you're protecting that penetration using a through penetration or a membrane penetration fire stop system. Now, I think a lot of people are familiar with what that looks like, again, for more of the mechanical services or plumbing services, like you see on the left image, where oftentimes this this includes, you know, a slightly oversized hole that the penetration is run through, and then in that hole, that annular space around that, you know, you're generally doing some type of a fire caulk material, plus maybe some fire safing in the hole, like mineral wool insulation, something like that. So again, it's fairly common for those types of mechanical systems, but I would say not as common for structural penetrations, in particular wood structural penetrations. But you know, this is what it would look like. So you can see here, uh, this landing beam has been installed. It's, it's penetrating the shaft wall. They've installed the gypsum wall board. And then you can see there's a small gap on all sides of the a beam, between the beam and the gypsum wall board. Um, so that gap would then be where the fire stop system is installed. Now, one thing you may find is if you go to, you know, say the website of a given fire stop manufacturer, you probably won't find in their list of, of pre-tested or predefined fire stop systems, you know, something matching this exact scenario where you have a wood beam penetrating a gypsum clad wood wall. Um, that's okay. Basically, usually what, what we see do, uh, done in that scenario is uh, you as the designer would contact the manufacturer, provide them with a detail or an image, you know, showing this is what we want to or need to do. Then in return, they would provide you with something like you see on the right, you know, an engineering judgment detail, an engineering judgment letter, basically saying, you know, you need to make the opening this large, you need to fill the opening with these materials, install them in this manner. And if you do so, 
then you're providing you know an F and T rating of one hour, two hours, or whatever your shaft wall needs to be rated for. Um, so that's generally the route that we've seen we've seen taken for these types of structural penetrations of shaft walls. So speaking of those types of penetrations, uh, let's have another poll question. All right, here we go. Structural penetrations in shaft walls are permitted when? Are they never permitted? Always permitted with no additional protection measures required? The penetration was part of the fire tested assembly? Or they're only permitted when a structural penetration is non combustible? All right, 80% say the penetration was part of the fire tested assembly and 13% only when the structural penetration, penetration is non-combustible. And Ricky, the real answer is? The real answer is, looks like the 80% had it correct. Uh, so that's good. Yes, so again, you, you are permitted to have uh, structural penetrations in shaft walls, and then the code doesn't make any distinction as to whether or not that penetrating item is combustible or not, uh, but it does have the requirement that you protect those penetrations with a fire stopping system. Um, so just wanted to emphasize that. All right, so we, we mentioned a little bit ago in the presentation that there is this unique scenario in some cases of having a shaft wall that's also an exterior wall. Again, this is common in say, multifamily occupancies where your stair shafts, uh, your stair towers are you know at the ends or at the corners of the building. Uh, if we turn to 713, this again is the shaft enclosure section. This is basically saying if you do have this scenario of an exterior wall that's also a shaft wall, then you're going to follow the code requirements for exterior walls and not for shaft walls because there are some conflicting requirements there. Um, so in this case, you're going to follow just the exterior wall requirements. So now for determining fire resistance ratings as opposed to it being a function of how many stories the shaft enclosure is connecting. Um, now it's gonna be a function of what does table 601 and potentially table 602 and IBC have to say. Um, you can see here, if we're a bearing exterior wall, for example, let's say we're doing a type 3A building, um, then your bearing exterior wall would be rated for two hours. If you're a non-bearing exterior wall, then you'll be referenced to table 602. Table 602 provides fire resistance ratings as a function of fire separation distance. So fire separation distance is really looking at how close is the exterior wall of your building to say an adjacent building or the, the property line or an adjacent public street, those types of things. Um, so it is possible to have an exterior wall that is non-rated and it's possible that that exterior non-rated wall is a shaft wall. If you do have that unique scenario, then there is some code language that basically um, provides a means of, pro of protecting the shaft enclosure itself um, in the unique scenario that some adjacent walls to that shaft wall also have a non-fire resistance rating. So there's a lot of words on the, the slide here. Hopefully an image can help explain this better. So you can see here, this is looking plan view where you have, you can see the stair shaft enclosure um, and let's say you can see there's this exterior wall. It's also a shaft wall. Let's say that that doesn't require a fire resistance rating. It's a non-bearing wall and it's fire separation distance is great enough such that it doesn't need a fire resistance rating. If there is an adjacent exterior wall to this exterior shaft wall, that's, that's less than or equal to 100, um, excuse me, less than 180 degrees from that exterior shaft wall. And if that wall is also non-rated, then you have to do one of two things. You either have to rate the exterior shaft wall for a minimum of one hour, or rate those adjacent sections of exterior wall for a minimum of an hour. And that has to extend at least 10 feet away from the shaft enclosure. Um, basically what the code is trying to do here is to reduce or minimize the opportunity or possibility of having a fire start in the building somewhere else um, extend through a non-rated exterior wall and then jump across into the non-rated shaft enclosure wall and then you have a fire in the shaft enclosure itself. So it's a unique case um, but you know it does come up from time to time. We've seen it apply to several projects. Um, so just something to keep in mind also to point out the fact that 
not only does this affect the fire resistance rating of the wall itself, it also requires fire rated glazing on any openings within this um, protected section of exterior wall. All right, let's talk through a couple of structural implications of using wood frame shaft walls. Um, and the first one is dealing with what I com commonly refer to as having hinges in an exterior wall. Um, so to explain that, this, this detail here is really showing you know, a cross section of, let's say we have a, a shaft, a stair shaft, that's on the exterior side of the building. So we have our exterior wall, then an intermediate landing, and then we go back to our typical floor framing. Um, in our typical floor framing scenario, as our exterior wall is subject to out of plane loads, like you see in the image on the left, you know, wind or seismic loads acting out of plane, um, our studs essentially go into bending and they're placing those out of plane reactions onto the floor diaphragm. That floor diaphragm is then bracing those studs and of course is transferring those diaphragm forces back into shear walls and resolving those down to the foundation. Well, if we have something like, you know, going back to this slide here, something like we see here, where our typical plate elevation for our, our wall studs lands at an elevation where we don't have floor framing, let's say in this case, like you see here, you know, we have an intermediate height landing, or maybe this is an elevator shaft and there's no framing within that shaft enclosure. Now we've essentially lost, uh, as the image on the right shows, we've lost the floor diaphragm and its ability to brace those out of plane wall reactions for wind and seismic. So how do we deal with that potential hinge? There's a couple of options. I think um, you know one option would be the fact that we do have these wall plates and you know at the typical floor plate elevation um, for out of plane loads for wind and seismic, they're oriented in a strong axis direction, right? So you could say, let's let's assume that those are acting together and essentially acting as a beam spanning horizontally. Um, across the entire opening of the shaft. Now, one thing to keep in mind if you do that is where the joints in those plates are. Ideally, you specify that there be no joints within those plates across the entire shaft opening so that they can span across the entire width of that shaft enclosure. Now, another option would be to actually place a framing member within the wall plane with its sole purpose being to span horizontally and resist these out of plane forces. Um, you know, oftentimes that the width of that member could match the, or very closely match the width of the wall. Um, another interesting detail you could do here, if it works structurally, is actually have the depth of that member match the typical floor joist depth. Um, the reason for doing that is that basically it keeps all of your wall plates at a consistent elevation around the entire building. Um, so again, a, a photograph to help illustrate what this horizontally spanning member would look like in the plane of the wall. Uh, what this image is here, you can see the stairs starting to come up. There's this intermediate height landing. And then, you know, probably three feet up from there is the typical floor line elevation. Now, this is an exterior wall, this back wall, uh, that's also a shaft wall. So we have this, this scenario of this potential hinge. So this member was installed and it spans from the far left side, kind of that corner of the shaft all the way to the right beyond where the image extends, um, you know, fully across the shaft enclosure and just provide the means of resisting these out of plane stud reactions. All right, so let's talk a little bit about selecting an assembly for our shaft enclosure walls. Now we know, you know, what are the requirements for what materials can we use? We've talked through, is this a one or two hour rated wall? There's also some other requirements, of course, to think about things like does the shaft wall also need to function as a shear wall? Um, acoustics is a big concern, you know, especially when we have, say, something like a stair or an elevator shaft that's directly adjacent to a hotel room or somebody's apartment. So getting really good acoustical performance of that shaft enclosure wall is important. Um, speaking of acoustics, of course, usually the thicker the wall is, the better the acoustics are. Um, but of course, there's some limitations on how thick of a wall you can go because now the thicker the wall is, you're eating up some of your rentable or sellable floor space right on the other side of the wall. So there's a number of things that really need to go into this final decision of, of what wall assembly do we select. This is just showing you know, some of many available one hour rated wall systems that could work uh, 
as a shaft enclosure wall. Um, but basically, I've broken these down into three different categories. Um, single wall systems, which is what the image that you see here shows, are basically just a single row of wood studs, you know, typically clad on both sides with a gypsum wallboard material. Um, to get better acoustical performance, you'd usually have a resilient channel on one of the faces of that wall between the studs and the gypsum. Um, double wall systems, basically taking two rows of wood studs with about an inch gap between them. Um, that has pretty big benefits for acoustics. Um, and then also shaft liner systems. Um, shaft liners, we'll talk about those in just a second, but it's basically a, a means of using thicker, usually one inch thick gypsum wallboard panels that are specifically made for shaft and um, unit separation wall applications. Same thing for two hour walls. You can see just again, some example rated tested assemblies framed with wood that could work for a two hour shaft wall. Again, single walls some double walls um, and then shaft liner systems. So speaking of these shaft liner systems, um, this graphic shows what we're talking about here. So the, the two layers of, of gypsum that are more in that um, teal color, kind of in the middle of that wall assembly, these are the two panels, the two shaft liner panels. Each of those are an inch thick, um, typically fabricated in 24 inch widths, um, and then height you know, vary with manufacturer. These are very common if you've done any type of uh, townhouse design or construction. They're commonly used at the, uh, like the, the unit separation wall or party wall construction. Um, so two layers of this panel will give you a two hour fire resistance rating. One layer gives a one hour fire resistance rating. And as you can see here, they're, they're a non-structural wall. They're really only intended to carry their own self weight. And even at that, they have some limitations. So they do have these, you can see the clip angle that attaches that to the adjacent wood structural wall. And that wood wall is there to brace these shaft liner panels in their out of plane direction. All right, so now we're gonna talk about the intersection detail of where we have a floor and a shaft wall intersecting with each other. And really, what are some of the unique considerations we need to think about here? Now, I will point out that this intersection of a rated floor to a rated wall is not something that's specifically addressed in the building code. So, of course, based on that, there are going to be some differences in how those code requirements are interpreted and, and applied and enforced. Um, I will point out that at, at Woodworks, we have a team of 12 regional directors um, and each of them is, is very up to date on, you know, for, for these shaft wall details, what has been accepted, what is working successfully on several projects. So I would recommend you get in touch with your local Woodworks regional director and get a better feel for, say, in a given county or city, you know, what are some details that have been used successfully in the past. Um, so with that, let's jump into uh, looking at some details and how we can go about uh, rationale and justification for these. From a high level perspective, of course, we really have two options when we're talking about floor to wall intersections in typical wood frame construction. On the left, we have just standard platform framing where we have wall floor supported on that and then wall started up above again. A semi balloon frame detail is where we're extending our studs all the way up tight to the underside of the floor sheathing and then hanging our floor system off of that. Now, if you remember, we talked um, a little bit ago in this webinar about the supporting construction requirements of the building code. And we said those are really intended to apply to discontinuous shaft walls. We have seen some projects get into the area of saying this detail you see on the left of saying that that floor structure, that floor joist is acting as supporting construction. And again, that's really not what that code section was meant, was meant to apply to. Um, so regardless of, of, of that condition, there is still the requirement of the continuity provisions. Remember we said there that fire barriers and shaft enclosures have to be continuous to the underside of the floor sheathing. So in that case, how could you justify the image on the left that that is providing continuity of fire resistance rating up tight to the underside of the floor sheathing? Uh, so that's what we're gonna talk through uh, in this image you see here. Now the analogy that I like to use in this scenario is Say we have like on the left, we have a, a partial height wall, say it's four or five feet tall, the two hour rated masonry wall. Then directly on top of that, we're going to stack another two hour rated wall, but it's of different construction. Maybe it's a, 
cold form steel wall. Maybe those two walls are even of different thicknesses overall, but they still both have a two hour fire resistance rating. Um, I think most people would agree that that is a continuous two hour rated uh, wall, even though they're not of the same construction, we're just stacking two two hour rated walls on top of each other. So taking that analogy and applying it to this floor to wall intersection detail, I think we can do the same thing where we're saying, you know, from the top of the floor below to the underside of the floor joist, that's one of our two hour rated wall assemblies. And then we're stacking on top of that another two hour rated assembly that's just the depth of the floor structure. In this case, you can see it's using two layers of uh, wood blocking between the floor joists. So looking at that detail, how could we actually justify that these two layers of blocking are providing continuity for a two hour fire rated wall assembly? Well, for that, we turn to uh, chapter seven of IBC. Chapter seven references uh, this document that you see here, which is NDS. This is the American Wood Council's National Design Specification for Wood Construction. Chapter 16 of that document provides a means of calculating fire resistance ratings of wood members for up to two hours. Um, it uses a nominal char rate of an inch and a half thickness of wood per hour of fire exposure. Um, and that's true for non-structural elements such as this blocking would be. Um, so that could be one means of justifying that detail that we saw previously, two layers of blocking. So each is providing an hour of fire resistance rating. Therefore, you get the two together. You have two hours continuity through the depth of the floor up to the underside of the floor sheathing. Another document that's really helpful with this floor to wall intersection is this Design for Code Acceptance 3 or DCA3. Uh, this is a document also from the American Wood Council. You can access for free on their website. And it provides some of these floor to wall intersection details. It is specifically written looking at exterior wall to floor intersections in type three construction. Um, but I think that the, the rationale and the details specifically looking at fire resistance rating continuity through the floor depth also apply to shaft enclosure walls. And not only are the details in here really nice, the other thing that has been very beneficial is the, the, the text, the narrative that you see here, where it's basically walking step by step through, you know, what is the, what is the code path for justifying that this does meet the intent of the code? So I think this, these details and the narrative that you see here can be really beneficial in justifying some of these proposed conditions. Now, just a few other options for, for this floor to wall intersection detail. You know, maybe you're doing top cord bearing trusses. You know, this is showing, again, you're basically just typically notching the wall gypsum around those. In that case, then you are creating the structural penetration of a shaft wall that is permitted, um, but you're generally protecting that penetration with a fire stopping system. Another example detail, um, this here is basically creating a scenario so that the only thing penetrating this shaft wall is the floor sheathing. Um, and again, by definition, that's not obstructing continuity of a fire barrier, so that is permitted. We don't have to do anything special there in terms of fire stopping. Um, here, the detail that was used was basically running a beam parallel to the shaft wall, you know, about 16 inches off of it. All of the floor joists uh, were supported, hung from that beam, and then the floor sheathing extends um, from that beam into the shaft enclosure wall. Um, and then lastly, another option that some projects have used are these proprietary types of hangers that uh, uh, basically allow the ability to span over one or two layers of uh, gypsum wallboard. So as, as you can see here, say both layers of gypsum wallboard extend up between the wood stud wall and the end of the floor joists. And then this hanger spans over those and top cord or top flange, I should say, on the top plates of the wall behind it. Um, so just another option, um, depending on, again, what the, the authority having jurisdiction in your region or your city may require, conversation with them on these types of details, you know, early on in design is always a good idea to avoid surprises down the line. And then looking at, you know, conditions of shaft liner systems. Um, you can see, you know, the image on the right is, is really showing the fact that these shaft liner systems, even though the code doesn't necessarily require you to completely bypass the floor structure, 
Um, just by nature of how these systems are installed, that's essentially what they're doing. Um, there are some systems like you see on the left, which are a, kind of a modified approach of that. So these are using CH studs. So it's a, a smaller section of cold form steel stud where you can see there's a one inch thick layer of shaft liner panel on the left and then two layers of just typical 5 8 type X gypsum wallboard on the right. Um, in some cases, these, have, these systems have limiting uh, overall heights of wall system. The reason for that is mainly because they're intended to be non-structural. Um, so even just supporting their own self weight, they can start to exceed their axial capacity. Um, so, you know, there's a couple of different ways you can do that. The image on the left shows basically cantilevering out the floor sheathing to pick up or to support the self weight of these shaft liner systems. Um, as this image here also shows, you know, another option that we've seen used is to have a small structural steel angle that's attached to say this rim joist and extends out and supports uh, these shaft liner panel systems. So a couple of options there. Going back to mass timber shaft walls, um, but specifically looking at how do those interface in terms of this floor to wall intersection. Um, the difference here is that typically mass timber shaft walls are installed in lifts such that one panel may be two to three or maybe even four stories tall. So you're generally framing the mass timber floor panel into the side face of that as opposed to doing more of a platform frame detail. Um, and so as the image you can see here shows, you know, you're generally doing some type of a ledger detail. You know, oftentimes this will be a wood ledger attached to the face of the mass timber shaft wall that your floor panel or your floor framing would simply bear on. All right, I mentioned at the beginning that we have these three different types of shafts. Everything we talked through pretty much applies to all of them, but I do want to focus briefly on some unique aspects of each of these um, as it pertains to some detailing considerations. So the first one we'll take a look at is stair shafts. And specifically the fact that as we think about attaching the stair framing, and I'm thinking mainly the intermediate landing framing to the shaft walls, we are often faced with this scenario of needing to attach that framing to the shaft walls through one or two layers of gypsum. Um, so as you can see, you know, in these images here, um, construction sequencing is a consideration or a concern. So what some projects will do is they'll actually go around and install uh, one or two strips of gypsum wallboard, and then that allows the ledger to be installed through those layers of gyps, gyp to the wall studs, uh, but they don't have to install all of the gypsum on the interior of the shaft here. Of course, once the framing is done and the, the gypsum insulation crew comes in, they can do the rest of this. But of course, that does create the scenario where you have fasteners extending through maybe an inch and a quarter thickness of gypsum wallboard, um, which of course doesn't have uh, the same shear capacity that the wood ledger and the wood stud do. Um, there are some uh, fastener manufacturers that have done some testing on this, have some literature, also, the American Wood Council has a document, Technical Report 12 or TR12, um, that talks through designing fasteners that extend through essentially a non shear layer or hollow cross section. Um, so, that's a good reference document for this. Uh, moving on to elevator shafts, of course, the unique as aspect here is that we need to provide posts in the wood frame uh, elevator shaft wall that can resist the rails and the rail loads that are imparted on those posts. Um, so this is looking at obviously a plan view of an elevator enclosure with wood frame shaft walls around. Um, you can see on the, the, the top wall here, we have these large wood posts. Now, generally these posts consist of multiple layers of a, a wide face material. So that could be like say a, a two by 12 or an 11 and 7 8 LVL, uh, something like that. That's wide facing the shaft itself so that you have a nice wide surface to attach the rails themselves to, the rail post to. Um, then at the end of each of those uh, wide faces, kind of as a cap or an H stud system, you know, then you're generally installing either two by fours or two by sixes, depending on the depth of the shaft wall. Um, so that provides some good um, bending capability in both directions, as well as good axial capacity, as you generally have these rail forces acting in all three directions. Um, and then MEP shafts, mechanical shafts, usually the unique aspect of these is that they're small in size. 
what that means is that it's typically difficult to just physically get into them and finish, you know, for, for um, you know, using tape and, and mud and paint to just physically get inside and finish them after the fact. So in order to address that, the shaft liner panel system that I talked through previously is often used. The nice part of that is that it's a tilt up system. You can tilt it up from outside of the shaft and then you don't have to get back inside the shaft afterwards and finish that face. Um, so those shaft liner panel systems are pretty handy in small shaft applications. Um, and then just uh, one more topic before we leave a few minutes for question and answer. Um, and that is going back to this image that we saw at the beginning of the presentation. And if we are going down the road of using a non wood shaft wall in a building that's otherwise framed in wood, um, just some unique aspects to consider. Um, and I'm, I'm saying specifically masonry shaft walls here because I think that's the most common, but a lot of what I'll talk through here would also apply, say, to you know, a concrete shaft wall as well. The two main differences to point out is number one, seismic performance, and number two, differential material movement. So from a seismic performance perspective, um, you can see here, this is a table from ASCE 7, which lists the seismic response coefficients for different um, seismic force resisting systems. So for light frame wood shear walls, we have an R of six and a half. And then for masonry shear walls, it depends on you know, to what level we detail for seismic resistance. Um, we have R values that range from two to five and a half. Now the higher the R factor is, the lower the seismic forces are. So you can see right off the bat, if we're using masonry shear walls, even if everything else is equal, our seismic forces are going to be higher. <clears throat> Excuse me. The other thing that, that comes into play here too is just the mass or the weight of the wall itself. Um, mass of a structure is also directly tied to seismic forces. Um, and therefore you can see that you know, masonry, a typical masonry shaft wall is gonna weigh about three times as much as a typical wood frame shaft wall. Um, so that increase in weight will obviously have a direct correlation to increase in seismic forces. Um, and then the other item that I mentioned is material compatibility. Um, and this is really dealing with the difference in terms of how wood as a material performs uh, as it interacts with moisture versus how other materials do. So we know that wood is hygroscopic, meaning it, it has the ability to absorb moisture, to, to give off moisture. As it does that, it expands, it shrinks, um, whereas other materials like CMU don't. In particular, they don't shrink. Um, sometimes they'll slightly expand in size. So you have this scenario of a wood frame floor wall structure surrounding a, uh, a masonry shaft wall, for example, and the two are, are not acting together in terms of material movement. Best case scenario would be to just provide an isolation joint between the two, um, but in some applications such as, you know, say an elevator door threshold, you obviously have to tie them together in order to avoid, um, you know, a lip where your door threshold is. So I would say if you are doing that, probably the thing to keep in mind is to, to try to spread that differential out over as far a distance as possible. You know, meaning if your wood frame structure surrounding it has shrunk and settled down a little bit, but your shaft wall hasn't, try to spread that differential movement over, you know, say multiple bays of framing as opposed to just over the next 16 inches. Uh, we do have a resource that talks through that specific topic, differential material movement and wood shrinkage um, in great depth. You can grab that from our website at woodworks.org. Um, and then we also have this document that really covers much of what the presentation went through in terms of code requirements and details. Um, so if, if you're interested in diving into more of that, that's also available on our website uh, right now as well. So with that, um, that's all I have for presentation, but I do know we've had some questions come in. So I'd like to to turn it back to Marcy for just a minute, and then um, I think Lori has some questions for us. All right, thank you, Ricky. That was a great presentation. I know I definitely got a lot out of it, and I know we've had lots of positive feedback already. Um, first quick question, uh, some folks wanted to confirm that we were all on the same page with regards to what version or what year of the IBC uh, today's presentation was geared towards? Sure, yeah, so with the exception of, I, I showed two slides relative to the new provisions in the 2021 IBC, 
that allow taller mass timber buildings. Um, so those were both referencing the 2021 IBC. Um, but aside from those two, everything else in the presentation was based on the 2012, 2015, and 2018 versions of IBC. All right, great. Uh, we had a lot of questions on the mass timber panel connections. Can you talk about how some of these connections um, in these shafts would be achieved for, for example, maybe a CLT um, mass timber shaft? Sure. Um, let me go back a couple slides. And it, I would say that it comes down to a couple of things. Whoops, I passed it. Sorry. So this one here. I would say that it comes down to a couple of things. The first one is understanding um, what method was used to demonstrate fire resistance ratings of the mass timber shaft wall itself. Um, what I mean by that is that there are really at this point two main options for demonstrating fire resistance ratings of a mass timber wall. Um, one of those is using the method that I referenced in AWC's um, NDS chapter 16, where that's a calculation based approach. The other method is to reference um, an actual mass timber fire tested wall assembly. So an E119 fire test of a mass timber wall. And there are several of those tests that have been concluded um, within those. So if you're going the route of specifying that, uh, say a tested assembly, within that test report, you'll find information on things like what did those, what connections were used in that tested assembly. You know, sometimes that's a half lap connection detail. Um, in other cases, it's a surface spline detail. So I would say reference the tested assembly report if that's the route you're going. Um, and then for things like, you know, this detail that you see here, where you have say a ledger attaching to a shaft wall, um, plus a floor framing panel attaching to that ledger. Um, you certainly want to design those connections themselves for whatever the fire resistance rating of the floor structure here would need to be. Um, AWC has another document called Technical Report 10, TR10, that does discuss the design of mass timber connections for you know, things like beam to column, ledger to wall, those types of details. So I would say, Take a look at that document if you're not familiar with it. All right. Uh, we had a, a question come in on detailing for shrinkage considerations. I didn't know if you had anything that you would want to comment on uh, handling shrinkage with both mass timber shafts and, and traditionally or, or stick framing shafts. Sure. I mean, I would say for mass timber shafts, um, generally speaking, you're not concerned too much with shrinkage in, in terms of, of building height um, because mass timber shafts, regardless if it's a, an NLT or a CLT or DLT shaft, even MPP, um, you're, you're generally, you have laminations oriented vertically and wood from just the way that it shrinks and, and performs in terms of giving off moisture longitudinal shrinkage in wood is, is essentially negligible. Um, so in terms of overall building height and shrinkage for mass timber shaft walls, I would say it's usually considered to be negligible. For light frame wood shaft walls, um, it is something that needs to be considered. Now, the benefit with doing a wood frame shaft wall in an otherwise wood frame building is that yes, you are going to see shrinkage, but in theory, all of the building is shrinking at the same rate, it's shrinking together. And that's assuming that you're using the same types of details, uh, floor to wall details at the shaft wall that you're using, say, at interior partition walls, at exterior walls. Um, so there are, you know, there's a number of shrinkage topics that we could go into. I would, you know, reference people to, to this resource here. Um, it, it talks through the implications on things like, you know, when you have um, vertical tie rods for resisting uplift and overturning and how you accommodate shrinkage and things like those. Um, so in a brief nutshell, hopefully that provides some context and then I reference people to this document for more. Great. All right. I think we have time for one more question. Um, we, we had a question come in. This is a good one. So would you consider the proprietary joist hangers that you cited to be uh, 
a penetration of the fire barrier diaphragm? Um, and would, would they require fire caulking to be installed around each of those joist hangers? Uh, that's a good question. I would say, I mean, ultimately this probably is gonna be another item that should be discussed with the authority having jurisdiction, but in my experience is that no, those, those haven't required a fire stopping detail because they're so thin um, you know, we're talking about, you know, a gauge of metal versus you know, inches of thickness. Um, because they're so thin and really otherwise, they're allowing the gypsum wallboard to extend up to the underside of the floor sheathing, which again, by definition, is what a fire barrier is. Um, then we haven't seen those hangers be required to have separate um, fire stopping installation. All right, great. Well, thank you very much.